hear it from us, Lord. And Father, I pray that you just continue to open up our eyes and our ears, Lord, more and more every day so that we can see the days as your day gets closer to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good evening, church. How's everyone doing? Awesome. Ooh, I love that energy. (laughs) All right, let's go ahead and get ready to worship. You can stand or sit down. It's totally up to you. Let's go ahead and worship. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. the sky just singing like a cloud you're standing with us now Lord unveil our eyes you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brain. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brain. Show us. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us. Show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our brain. Open up the floodgates, we want to see you. y'all's conversation with the Lord, y'all's prayer. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, into wine open the eyes of the blind there's no one like you 
got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to um, 2 Samuel chapter 14. <clears throat> I'm going to kind of pick up where we kind of left off last week. If you remember, um, Absalom had killed his brother Amnon uh, after two years of <laughs> waiting to... Uh, to get revenge on his brother for raping his sister. And I think, um, you know, sometimes when you um, read the scriptures, that you can try to read into what's not written there for you, <laughs> you know. And it says that, that uh, Absalom waited two full years before he pulled this, <laughs> this maneuver on his brother, this murder, basically, this plotting this murder. And some commentators and some old preachers wonder if he was waiting to see if David was going to take care of business, if David was going to discipline his own son when he found out that his one son raped 
the daughter, one of his princesses, you know. And uh, David didn't do anything. And, you know, and we, we talked last week that probably David, David felt handicapped in his ability to discipline his own kids because of the sin he had committed. He didn't feel like he had the right to discipline his own kids and some of the same things that he himself had been guilty of. But at the same time, we can't let what we were guilty of in the past that's now covered by the blood keep us from teaching our kids to do the right things when we know what we did was wrong and the trouble it got, in, got us into. We got to teach them. We got to tell them. And David has not done that. And we'll see this snowball. And, and, and I tell you that in our day and age, there's a lot of people that don't know how to discipline their kids. Lots of people don't know how to discipline their kids. And it, and it shows big time in this world. And um, and so when, when Absalom kills his brother, uh, he takes off and he goes to um, his grandfather's house, the king. And uh, we're going to go ahead and just read, reread it uh, because, well, let's just read it in chapter 14. So Joab son of Zariah, perceived that the king's heart was concerned about Absalom. Absalom's kind of on the lam. And it's been three years up to this point. So it's been five years since this whole incident started. And Joab sent to Tekoa and brought there a wise woman and said to her, please pretend to be a mourner and put on mourning apparel. Do not anoint yourself with oil, but act like a woman who has been mourning a long time for the dead. So last week we talked about that. We read all this and how Joab set her up to go to the king to use a story to get the king to snap out of his depression. He's depressed because there's no restoration between him and his son. I have a son that's on the outs with me. I haven't seen him or heard from him in like a year and a half. He lives here in Waco. And uh, it's very difficult. Now, me, I'm trying to find him. I'm tr- I mean, I'm trying to get him back in my life. David is allowing Solomon, I mean, Absalom, to sit away from him with this guilt and shame. Now, in Psalm 51, we read Psalm 51 where David talks about God's forgiven him and blotting out his sin and washing him as white as snow and not remembering his sin no more. But yet David is somehow incapable of forgiving his son or showing his son this forgiveness. To restore him. And Absalom is wanting to come back. And David wants Absalom to come back. That's why he's depressed. That's why Joab is going to send this woman to him. And uh, so this woman goes and tells her story about her son. Let's just go ahead and read it because it sounds better when you read it. And when the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and prostrated herself and said, Help, O king. Then the king said to her, What troubles you? And she answered, indeed, I am I'm a widow. My husband is dead. Now your maidservant had two sons that fought, and the two fought with each, one, with each other in the field, and there was none to part them, but the one struck the other and killed him. And now the whole family has risen up against your maidservant, and they said, deliver him who struck his brother, that we may execute him for the life of his brother whom he killed. And we will destroy the air also, so they would extinguish my ember that is left and leave my hus- to my husband neither name nor remnant on the earth. Then the king said to the woman, go to your house and I will give orders concerning you. And the woman of Tekoa said to the king, my lord or king, let the iniquity be on me and on my father's house and the king and his throne be guiltless. So the king said, whoever says anything to you, Please bring him to me, and he shall not touch you anymore. It's interesting that when David is hearing the story, the way she's presenting it, David could care less about why they fought or who they were. He just wanted to honor and give this woman what she asked for. When in, in his own struggles with his own son, he's not doing for himself what he could do. And I think sometimes... We even do that. We, we think more about helping somebody else, and we're stuck. We find ourselves stuck. And so she's trying to dig this out of David, and it said, Then she said, Please let the king remember the Lord your God, and do not permit the avenger of blood to destroy anymore, lest they destroy my son, which was a legal 
right for them to do according to the law of Moses. And he said, as the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. So he's, he's pardoning this son who murdered his brother. Therefore, the woman said, please let your maidservant speak another word to, the, to my Lord, the king. And he said, say on. So the woman said, why then have you schemed such a thing against the people of God? For the king speaks the thing as one who, who is guilty in that the king does not bring his banished one home again. So she's turning around and saying, you're the one king that's not letting your son come home. Now, notice what she says. What she said is very, 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 very profound. Two things she says. For one, she says, for we will surely die and become like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. There's going to come a point in time where you can't go back and fix something. Fix it while you can fix it. Forgive while you can forgive. Don't wait until later. Because once it's later, it can be too late because you can't get water back from the ground that way. And then she goes on and she says something even more profound. And she said, yet God does not take away a life, but devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. From the foundation of the world, the Lord had a plan to redeem The banished ones. From the beginning of time, God had a plan to restore us who've been banished, you know, a way back to him. That's what the cross is, a way back. The cross is a scheme that God put up and played out and worked out so that we could be back to him again. Now, therefore, I have come... To speak of this thing to my Lord the King, because the people have made me afraid, and your maidservant said, I will now speak to the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his maidservant. For the king will hear and deliver his maidservant from the hand of the man who would destroy me and my son together from the inheritance of God. Your maidservant said, The word of my Lord the king will now. Be comforting, for as an angel of God, so is my Lord the king in discerning good and evil. And may the Lord your God be with you. Then the king answered and said to the woman, Please do not hide anything from me that I ask of you. And the woman said, Please let my Lord the king speak. So the king said, Is this the hand, is the hand of Joab with you in all this? And the woman answered and said, As you live, my Lord the king, no one can turn to the right hand or to the left from anything that my Lord the King has spoken. For your servant Joab commanded me, and he put all these words in the mouth of your maidservant. To bring about this change of affairs, your servant Joab Joab has done this thing, but my Lord is wise according to the wisdom of the angel of God to know everything that is in the earth. You know, it's great that, that God would allow this scenario will take place because sometimes you want to speak to somebody about something important in their life that they may be going through. But if you just come right out at them with the subject, maybe they'll be already put a defensive wall up. But if you can somehow pray for wisdom and share with them and then, you know, just let, let God use that as a doorway to something else. I've done that many times, a lot of times with my kids. <laughs> You know, I wanted to talk to him about something, but I didn't want to just come right at him. So I kind of went around about to get to him or told him a story or, or an example of something. Or even sometimes they use Bible stories to say, did you know this? And then, look, look, this is applying to you where you're at right now. And, um, and I think that, you know, it's not being sneaky. It's not being treachery or trickery. You're not doing something evil or wicked to, to get a positive result. You're just trying to get them to see things differently from a different perspective. And I think that's wisdom and that's, that's, that's wise. And God even shows us. I mean, it worked when Nathan went to David the first time and it's working right now. And it says, um, uh, to bring about this change of affairs. And I just, I thought that was interesting that the way it's mentioned like that because sometimes we need our affairs changed. <laughs> it said, then Joab... 
Go, go therefore, bring back the young man Absalom. Oh, and then the king said to Joab, all right, I have granted this thing. Go therefore and bring back the young man Absalom. Then Joab fell to the ground on his face and bowed himself and said, thank you to, to the, thank the king. And Joab said, today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight, my lord, O king, and that the king has fulfilled the request of his servant. So here's when it gets, starts getting good. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, let him return to his own house, but do not let me see his face. Man, you know, he, he stopped short of, of, of finishing. You know, when, when, when I mentioned this last week, when Jesus gives us the, the story of the, the prodigal son, you know, the, the, the father in that story was God. In that story, it was God. And the prodigal son was the nation of Israel. And yet, when, the nation, when, when anybody from the nation of Israel, one person runs to the Lord, the Lord runs to them. But sometimes earthly fathers stop and turn their, and, and turn their backs on their sons, or on situations. And, um, and what's going to happen is it's going to turn around. When, when Nathan the prophet told David when he sinned, he said, the, the sword will never depart from your family. David is going to play a part in bringing that sword into his family. That's what kind of blows me away. Could, could David have allowed the sword to come a different way to his family, or did David have to be a part? And because the way he's going to treat Absalom, he's basically going to become a part, because what, what he's going to do to Absalom is going to make Absalom mad, and we're going to see that here shortly, where he starts to usurp people away from David. And it's going to be very difficult for David, especially when Absalom is killed. And it says, uh, but do not let him see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house, but did not see the king's face. Now all Israel, now in all Israel, (laughs) there was no one who was praised as much as Absalom for his good looks. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Sound like somebody I know. I used to know until he lost that side tooth. <laughs> and listen to this. And when he cut the hair of his head at the end of every year, he cut it because it was heavy on him. And when he cut it, he weighed the hair of his head and 200 shekels, according to the king's standard, about six pounds. Six pounds a year. And he cut it off, and apparently he goes, I wonder how much that weighs. <laughs> and weighed it. You know, when, when, so- when Solomon uh, becomes the king, he gets men that almost probably look like Absalom because he gets these tall, big, muscular guys with long black hair. They all kind of look the same. They're all the same size. He has gold chips and flakes sprinkled in their hair so that it glistens when, this, when they're carrying him. It'll glisten, and they'll look shiny, and they stay nice and fit and oiled up. And uh, probably because he wanted to make, make he, he probably recognized his brother's beauty and said, I'm going to make my brother's beauty one of my sl- carriers because <laughs> they all look like Absalom, it seemed like. And the funny thing is, when you're a warrior, you do not want to have long hair. You do not want to get into a hand-to-hand fight with somebody with long hair. Ask any woman that's ever gotten a fight. <laughs> there has not been one woman fight where hair was not pulled unless she was bald or had Dorothy Hamill hair. Now, I don't know how gangster you are, but my wife is gangster. When my wife was a young girl, she was jumped. And they pulled her hair, and she said, why do them girls fight and just pull hair? She said, I couldn't comb my head for two weeks after that. <laughs> we were just talking about that yesterday. I'm sorry, baby. Because <laughs> they, they just pull hair, you know what I mean? I, and and you know, the, when Solomon dies, if, just in case you're not here that study, Solomon's going to be riding, and he's going to duck, and his hair is going to catch on a branch, and the horse is going to keep going. And he's going to be sitting there hanging by his hair. And then somebody's going to come up there and treat him like a piñata. That hair, get you. 
It ain't going to get me. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go. To Absalom were born three sons, one daughter. Now notice, notice Absalom here. And one of his daughters, whose name was Tamar, he named his daughter after his sister. And it says she was a woman of beautiful appearance. And, you know, one of the commentators said that Absalom, you know, carried all this high emotions inside of him. And eventually that's what's going to get the best of him. That he's not going to be able to control his emotions in the end, even though his emotions are really good and genuine and like naming his daughter after his sister, that's a very sweet thing to do, very sweet thing to do, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to catch up to him in a, in a bad way later. And then it says, and Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, but did not see the king's face. Therefore, Absalom sent for Joab. <laughs> Uh, to send him to the king, but he would not come to him. And when he sent ag- sent again the second time, he would not come. So apparently they're neighbors, and he's sending Joab to come to him to tell him, hey, why can't I see my dad? And so he said to his servants, see, Joab's field is near mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. Then I bet he'll come see me. <laughs> Don't try that with your neighbors. And the interesting thing is Joab's the most fierce warrior of all the Israelites. You don't just, if you burn his field, you must know he ain't going to come at you like that. And so notice what happens. It said, uh, then Joab arose, came to Absalom's house, and said to him, why have your servant set my field on fire? I just imagine you come up to him like this, like, what's the deal, man? What you, what you set my field on fire for? Just come walking up at him, you know, and notice what he says. Absalom answered, Joab, look, I sent to you, say, come, come here, so I may send you to the king and say, why have I come, come from Geshur? It would be better for me to still be there. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face, but if there's iniquity in me, let him execute me. If I've done anything worse than you've done, execute me. He's being arrogant now. He's being cocky. I mean, you know, to find forgiveness, you've got to have remorse. And regardless of whether he's mad at his father for not dealing with Tamar and Ab- Abnon, it's still not Absalom's place to execute that judgment. Now, as I mentioned last week, as a brother, <laughs> as a brother, I can't say that I wouldn't do that for my sister's name. Um, did you read the paper or the news where the father killed a man for apparently prostituting his daughter out, murdered him? He don't try, he's a million dollar bond. I mean, who can say a father like me wouldn't do the same thing either? But still, you know, there's still, you know, the one thing about God is he don't give you necessarily the justice you probably deserve, but justice still has to be answered for. And that's where Christ comes in. Christ takes that justice that should be on us and takes it on himself. But in light of knowing that, you can still have to face your own justice here. There's still justice in this life. There's still judges that's going to put judgment on you whether you're forgiven in heaven or not. There's heaven-bound murderers in prison right now. Absalom's not. He's mad. He's, he's upset. And, and, and I don't know that that's going to be an excuse, but he's going to use it as an excuse. And let me tell you something. The devil will always reinforce your excuse in your thinking. He will always reinforce that inside your head. So Joab went to the king and told him. And when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. Then the king kissed Absalom. 
After this, it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. So now he's beginning to start, to, to start this, this transition of trying to win the people over. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. And so it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision that Absalom would call to him and say, what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from such and such tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that I were made judge in the land and everyone who has had any suit or cause would come to me that I would give him justice because it's the king's job to appoint the heir. Absalom's trying to get it without the Lord ordaining it. Now, let me just tell all of us something. We all have appointed places in this life. And when we try to go to places that we're not appointed to and you try to force yourself to those positions, it's not going to be comfortable for you. It's not going to be easy. I will tell you this. The only, the only thing that I did to put myself in this position was I prayed. I, I, I showed up every day. And uh, I did the right thing that I was supposed to do each day. Went to work, did my thing, and, and it just happened. It, it, it put me here. A lot of people try to put themselves there. They try to force something on themselves, especially in the kingdom. And in, in, in the kingdom, there, it's got to be God to call you and to do it. When, when, when I got saved, I felt him tell me that, that I'm going to be a Christian the rest of my life. I'm going to be a pursuer and a proclaimer is what he told me. And, I, and for I'm fixed, next May, it'll be 30 years. Man. That's a good lady mama. <laughs> She's really happy I'm saved. But 30 years, listen, 30 years, man, and it's gotten way better. Gooder and gooder. You know, and, and I don't, and there's no forcing it. There's no. I told I, I had lunch with Eric and I was telling Eric, I said, you know, the good thing about when God puts you there. There's no fear of getting moved out. There's no worry of being taken over. There's no worry of losing it. You just, you, you just, you just know that it's God that did it because there ain't no way I did it, you know. And, and Absalom's trying to make it happen. And, and here's the deal. He's going to be successful until God takes him out because watch. It says, uh, and so it was. When anyone came near to bow down to him, so he's getting them to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand, take him, and he'd kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Listen, that's where I want to, I want to stop for a minute because to steal somebody's heart you have to have the ability to deceive them. Now, you know, I, re, I was looking on the internet and looking at that quote, and people use that like, oh, she stole my heart. Well, you know, you got to give it away. Nobody can take your heart. You steal your heart. But, it, but it's interesting that they would use that phrase that, that, um, that the Scriptures would use that phrase in a negative kind of tense. This is the negative sense. And so I started thinking about all the, all the scriptures that talk about being careful about the words of people and how they speak and how they say to you and how they can win you with their words. Now, let me tell you something. Politicians are really good. The, the, these people, they master the language. They master the language. They, they master... Look, even I think about the words that I use when I'm talking to somebody. Apparently not all the time. Sorry, babe. But most of the time, I think about the words that I'm saying, and I'm try, I try to be very careful with words that I say because words are very powerful. And, and here, now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. It's a New Testament. It's a New Testament warning. 
for New Testament Christians, which we are, that we have to be careful about the words we listen to, who's saying them, the context of which they're saying them, and why they're saying them. I mean, are they is it just... Because you know and I know that they'll tell us what we want to hear. No new taxes. Remember that? No new taxes. I remember that years ago. No new taxes. Let me tell you something. There ain't nothing that's not taxed. And they're finding new things to tax. You, you tax coming and going and sitting still. I, I guarantee if you, if you think about it, we can't trust none of them. Their words are worthless, especially if they're not pointing us to truth. Smooth words, flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Second Peter chapter 2, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Philippians. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state, for I have no one like-minded. Paul is saying there's nobody like him except Timothy that he knows of right now, who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. He just says they, they're all out there. I bet there's a lot of them that are still out there. Brethren, joining, following my example, note those who, are, who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. And of course, for our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus, I guarantee you there's not any philosophy, any saying that anybody can say that we cannot find a scripture to either add to it or to cause it to be a lie. There's not, there, it, no matter what anybody says, there's scriptures to go towards whatever. Answer any question, any ideas, any thoughts, any philosophies, there's a scripture for every occasion, everything. That God didn't leave a word from us that we don't need, that he didn't write down. And then it says this, useless wranglings. Just a lot of chitter-chatter, just a lot of talking of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a mean of gains. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. I just think that, especially in the days that we live in with so much media and, and so much information and so many things that we definitely have to be careful of who we listen to. We talked about it Sunday about shepherds and how important it is to know our shepherd's voice and to know the Lord's voice. And, and, and let me tell you something. I can listen to David and I can hear the Lord speak to me out of him. I can listen to Joe and I can hear the Lord speak out of all these people. It just, you know, the Lord uses many avenues to speak to us, not just one. And when you talk, my spirit will say, right on, or whoa, (laughs) I don't know about that. Because a couple of things that I've said that didn't jive with you, you came to me with it, I explained it, we were good with it. Because you have just as much responsibility to pay attention to my words as I do saying them. I got responsibility for saying them, but you have responsibility for listening to them. 
and uh, knowing whether or not God's speaking through me. We, we, we live in dangerous times, and, we're, and, and we want to, we, we're, you know, it's funny because the world is looking for somebody to come in and lead them. Just come in and take control of this thing and put it all together and put us all on the same page and, and lead us out of here. And let me tell you something. He's coming. He's coming, but he ain't going to be nice in the end. And we just want to make sure that we hear it just like a dog. Like I told you, my dogs, they, they can hear your voice. They recognize your voice. They don't recognize your face. They recognize your voice. That's for sure. Let's go ahead and pray. Thank God for, uh, for the rain. <laughs> Lord, I pray you teach us to learn your voice, Lord. Father, that we recognize the persuasive words of the enemy, the divisive words and deceitful words of the enemy, that we would recognize the enemy's voice, Lord. But we would definitely recognize your voice, Lord. If we learn your voice, we would definitely recognize the wrong one. And Father, I pray for those who are not sure which voice they're listening to. And Lord, I pray you open up our hearts and our ears to the truth, Lord, to the truth. Lord, I pray for my Trey. I pray wherever he's at, Lord God, that you're loving him, you're protecting him, you're watching over him, my son, and both my boys, Lord. I thank you, Lord. But you have our kids in your hands and you love them way more than we do. And Father, we just pray your heads of protection around all of them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. <laughs>